Well, happy Mother's Day, all you mums. Um, we should never underestimate the influence that our mothers have on us, really. I mean, mums are the most special people because no, no one else has a heart for the son or the daughter, uh, the child, than the mother has. And um, I'm grateful to God for my mum who is in heaven, but also for Mary who, you know, I'm really totally, I'm totally blessed to have uh, someone here who prays for me continually, who supports me, who is always there for me. So I just want to thank you, Mary. Um, it's an absolute honor, and God is uh, just blessing me mightily through you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> when I think of um, great women in the Bible, it's two women that always come to mind. One is obviously Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, and um, the other one is this woman in whose name we don't even know, but um, for me, this is one of the most vivid things and, and vivid stories, that, and, and also the most encouraging one because it's so full of faith. Uh, if you turn with me to 2 Kings uh, chapter 4, we'll be reading from verses 8 to 37. And it's Elijah and the Shanamites, the Shanamite woman. Um, as I said, this woman is incredible, and yet she must have been... Uh, someone that God had, had inspired and set apart because of the way he blessed her, and yet we don't even know her name. So I want to read it quickly, and then we're going to get into the meat of it. Uh, I think we'll, we'll all be blessed by the conduct and attitude of this awesome woman. From verse 8, it says, Now it happened one day that Elijah went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. Now, first of all, we've got to realize that this woman had targeted the prophet, you know, it wasn't just by accident. She had to persuade him to hang around, have some food. She wanted to be hospitable to him, make him feel welcome. Verse 9. And she said to her husband, look now, I know. In other words, I perceive that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let's make a small upper room in the, on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be when he, whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. In other words, now this wasn't a, just a haphazard, look, let's just go and, you know, there's a, um, yeah, there's a stable or there's, there's a, a another room. Now he said, look, let's build him something. Let him build him something that's really nice, really comfortable, so that when he comes, he can actually rest as well. Uh, so it must have taken some time, some effort, and some money. And it happened one day that he came there, uh, and he turned into the, uh, the top upper room and lay down there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, um, Call the Shan Shan Shanamite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said, and she said to him, sorry, and he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, What then is there to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, 
Well, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie or do not tease your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come. And Elijah, uh, sorry, that Elijah had told her. And the child grew. And now it happened that one day he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Now, I don't know about you, but that must have been the most traumatic experience any mother could ever have, is to actually have her son sitting on her knee and dying in her arms. Verse 21, And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. And she called her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God on Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shamanite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, It is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet and said, uh, but Gehazi came near and pushed her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet them. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now you see, this great man of God had no insight. God did not give him insight into what had happened. So he couldn't do what he normally did, which is just exercise all the power. So he, he, did, you know, he took his staff and said to Gehazi, his servant, go and just lay it on there. But she said, she was in control. She said, listen, I'm not leaving you. So he, she almost forced him to come, not knowing what had happened. Verse 31, Now Gehazi went ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice uh, nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. And Elijah came into the house. Now you can see, Elijah was already on his way. The servant had gone and done what Elijah had asked him to do, but God hadn't intervened yet. This went back to meet him and said, The child was not awakened. And Elijah came to the house where the child was, laying dead on his bed. And he went in and therefore shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child. And the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house, and again went up and stretched uh, himself out on him, and the chi child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. 
And he called Gehazi and said, call the Shamanite woman. So he called her. And when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. And she picked up her son and went out. Now, as I said, that's the most incredible story. It was, there's just so many you know, parts of it that we, we can extract vital and, and, and uh, important information about faith, you know, about attitudes, uh, about steadfastness, about trust. It's, it's just full, full of that. But I, I want, th today's message is called God is Coming to Town. It's going to challenge us with some things. Um, you know, if God was coming to your town, um, as we see the prophet visited regularly, uh, and you believed that, uh, that, that God was, was visiting, what would your reaction be? So Elijah was a great man of God. He, he was a prophet to the northern kingdom, and he traveled from town to town doing the Lord's work. However, he lived by faith, so the Lord uh, would cause someone to show him kindness and hospitality wherever ne necessary and whenever necessary. The chapter begins with uh, Elijah traveling to the small town called uh, Shunem. And, um, you know, because his mother's there, I, I really thought it would be good to discuss this woman. Um, extraordinary woman. Uh, we can learn a great deal from the way she handled one of the most traumatic and tragic situations any mother could ever face, and that is having her son die in her lap. What was it about this woman that caused her to have such an awe-inspiring faith and as a result receive the astounding blessing from God to raise her son from the dead? She wasn't anything special. In fact, her name isn't even recorded and yet she received a mighty touch. What was it about her life that caused God to intervene in such an incredible way? If God was able to empower the life of a nameless woman living in a godless time, because at that, it, that time there were, you know, everyone had turned away from God. There weren't a lot of believers around. Then surely he can touch our lives too. There are four things I would like to pick up on today, things that we need to emulate it, if we're going to encounter God's power the way she did. I've called today's message, God is coming to town. And at the end, I'm going to pose a few questions concerning how we would react to the statement if we really believed it to be true. Would we be ready for the Lord? Or would we simply let him pass by? This woman believed that God's chosen representative was in town, and therefore God himself was in town also. So she wanted to make the man of God welcome. For that reason, she made a room for him, and she received God's promise of a child. Finally, she held on to that promise, even though it seemed to be dead. So I want us to examine four points. The first one is, she made God welcome. She made the man of God, who was God's representative, but it says that she perceived him to be a holy man. In other words, she knew that when this man was there, the presence of God was also there. Amen? Now, by her making Elijah welcome, she was in fact indirectly making God welcome. From the start, it's obvious that this woman had a hunger for God. Notice she was on the lookout for God, and as a result, she was able to recognize God's man when he entered the town and immediately persuade him to come and have something to eat. Now you think, oh, well, what's this got to do with me, Pastor? Well, you're going to soon find out what it has to do with you. So she looked after him every time he was in town. 
Every time he was in town, he would stop by. Are you on the lookout for God to manifest himself in your life? Do you really want to encounter God? Do you really want to be empowered by God's Spirit? Is God made to feel welcome in every area of your life, in the highways and byways of your daily existence? And if God were to come and manifest himself, is he going to find your life somewhere worth coming back to? You know, she prepared everything, and the man of God, every time he came, was so, made to feel so welcome. And obviously she spoiled him. Food, I'm sure gave him clothing. I'm sure this wasn't just a smelly little room. I'm sure you walked in, there must have been lovely flowers and a, an aroma. You know, he wanted to stay there and, and, and get some rest. If this woman's house had been shabby and full of unbelief, the chances are Elijah would never have wanted to return. Many people ask God for his power, but expect him to meet them in filthy lives and unbelieving hearts. This woman made her home welcoming and fed the man of God so well, he always wanted to return again and again. She made God welcome. Are you making God welcome in your life? Second thing, she made a room for God. When Elijah had visited her house regularly, this woman approached her husband and proposed that they build him a room so that he could stay and not just visit. So she wanted something more permanent for God, not God arriving and then going. She wanted to make a space, a place, for him. She expanded her house to ensure that the man of God could have a more permanent dwelling. She ensured that it was fitted with everything that Elijah would need. I assume that her husband was a godly man, as he obviously agreed with these plans, and the woman's desire to have the man of God resident in her house not only blessed her, but blessed the whole household. When you make room for God to take up permanent residence in various aspects and areas of your life, it won't just affect you. It's going to affect everyone around you. The family set about to build a nice room for the man of God. This would have taken time, money, and effort. But the woman's desire to have the power of God dwelling in her house meant that it was worth it. If you want God's power to be permanently dwelling in your life, then you need to count the cost. It doesn't come easy. It may mean that uh, you're having to be stretched to the limit. We don't know whether they were stretched, whether you know, they were super wealthy. It doesn't say. It just says that she had this desire. She had this passion. She had a heart for God. And so she was prepared to do it. Now, we're talking about a whole town. We don't know how many, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of people there were, but this woman alone decided, I perceive that is a holy man. And when he's around, God's around. So I'm going to honor him as if God himself were visiting me. If we want God's to be permanently dwelling in our lives, we need to count the cost. It doesn't come easy. It may mean you're having to be stretched to the limit. If you want God's power in your life, then you need your faith extended sufficiently to accommodate the miracle you require. She needed a miracle. But let's... Because she had the heart for God, because she, she trusted God, because she could hold on to the promise... She never wavered. So her faith was stretched, but it didn't let her down. This can be a painful process sometimes. There are many people who desire God's miraculous power in their lives or in their churches, 
But the fact is, he has no way to take up residence. He is neither welcome nor has anywhere to stay. It's not like that at Cornerstone. Amen. You know? That's why I keep saying, we have a heart for God's house. Man, we want God to, to be welcome here. His Holy Spirit is welcome. And, you know, get this craziness of, well, it's just about me and God and the universal church and I can go anywhere, do anything and that. No, God loves it when His people gather together. Amen. So we make Him welcome. Third thing, she received from God. God blesses this woman with more than she had ever dreamed or hoped for. Why did God bless her so greatly? It was probably because she had a genuine desire to serve Elijah without expecting anything back. Her primary motive was to serve, to be a blessing. It was while the man of God was resting in the very room that she had given him that God prompted him to try and bless the woman back. Even when asked, she didn't desire to be given anything. She was content with what she had. That is God's holy presence in her house. She just came to the door. It says she stood in the doorway when he was speaking to her. It was as if God was in there. It was as if the Holy of Holies was there. How often do we forget that, we first, that we're first called to serve the Master before considering our own needs? Luke 17, 7 and 8. If your primary motive when you come to God is to serve Him, then He will ensure that your needs are met. Just as it was here, while Elijah was resting in the room that the woman had prepared for him, he sought to find out how he could be a blessing to her. In the same way, while we are seeking to serve God with no hidden agendas, he will find ways to bless us in all matters of life. The key is to serve him first. You know, God's hand is extended toward us, always. But if we want to serve Him, let me tell you, what He has in His hand for you is far more than you can ever hope, dream, or imagine. Elijah even offered this woman the option of him speaking to the rulers of the land and the king on her behalf. She refused. Being content with what she had, but then he found out exactly what would bless her. Likewise, God will bless us in the same way if we seek to serve him first. He will bless us with the best gift that we could ever imagine. He knows your heart. He knows what you really, really desire. But she had no agenda except, I want to make you welcome. I want you to come back as often as you can. Because when you're here, I sense God's presence here. And I thirst and I hunger for God's presence. So I don't want anything. I just want to keep serving you. And look what God did. So the prophet was able to speak it out and say the same time this in, in, a, in a year, you will be with son. The woman sought to make the man of God welcome in her house, and in so doing, she unintentionally invited a miracle. Hallelujah. When we make the Holy Spirit welcome in our lives and in our church, He also brings resurrection power to the house. If you want to experience the miraculous power of God, you have to stop coming to God asking what He can do for you and start asking what you can do for Him. It is in this attitude, in the midst of seeking to serve him and make him welcome and making him welcome, that God will manifest his supernatural and miraculous deeds of power. I guarantee you. She had no agenda. It says that she perceived. She recognized 
that he was a holy man. And she had such a hunger for God. Her connection with God had to be through this man. So she said, well, I want him around as often as I can because when he's around, I know God's around. Well, we have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Who manifests the presence of God. Andrew, great to see you. Lovely to see you. Hallelujah. True son of the house. Amen. But you see, it's God's, God's house is a place where we can flourish. She knew that. But imagine bringing God's house to your house, which is what she intended to do. And she said, well, I'm not going to let this guy go. And God honored that. She unintentionally invited a miracle into her house. God knows what you need, what your greatest desire is. You don't have to ask him. You don't have to beg him. All she wanted to do was be in his presence and serve him. And God took care of the rest. Hallelujah. And the fourth and final thing, she held on to the promise. The woman had gladly received the man of God. She had expanded her house to give him a place to rest. And because of that, she had received a promise greater than anything she could have ever imagined. She had also started to see the promise grow. Now, she, she wanted a child. She had probably prayed to God many times to have a child. But she just got to that place where she thought, look, my, my husband's far too old now. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, but it did not deter her from wanting to serve God. It didn't take away the hunger for God. She hadn't got angry with God and frustrated with God. And there was no ulterior motive in her inviting Elijah for a meal and persuading him. All she wanted was God. Amen. Amen. And because of that, she received a promise. God promised her a son. And guess what? She was there. That promise was manifest. And she watched the promise grow. And then years later, she found out that the promise that God had given her had died. Her son, whom she cherished and never thought she could have in the first place had died in her arms. She had been given more than she could, could ever have hoped or dreamed for, but now it had all, in a moment, suddenly been taken away. She was in bitter distress and would have been completely heartbroken. All her dreams had been shattered. So what did she do? Get angry with God? Go and say, I'm going to go and nail this prophet because, I mean, he spoke it out and I'm going to accuse you liar. I told you not to lie to me. I said, don't lie to me. And yet, look what happened. You must have lied to me. No. She held on to the promise. She laid the child on Elijah's bed. She didn't tell anybody else. And she, she ran straight to the man of God, the very vessel whom God had chosen through which to make his promise. I love it because all of us would have been tempted to tell someone. But she goes to the very place where the promise was given and she puts the promise, the child of the promise, in that place. And it wasn't until Elijah returned to the very place that she'd prepared for him, where the woman had already received, or originally received the promise, that the promise was resurrected. Some of you might be in the same situation. 
You've been in a position where you have sought God and have received your promise. And thereafter, the promise has grown. But suddenly, before your very eyes, it's died. And now you feel helpless and are in a worse situation than before. If that's you, I have good news for you today. God is faithful to his promises. And he is able to do miraculous things, exceedingly abundantly above all that you may ask, think, or imagine. He will raise up that promise, even though it might appear to be dead. You need to do exactly what this woman did. Don't look to anything else or anyone else. Don't try doing it in your own strength. You will merely end up with a propped up corpse. You know, she didn't wail before God. She could have sat there and all day just cried and wailed and said, this is my son, God, you promised me. How can you accuse God of all kind of vile things? She calmly went and put him in the very place where the man of God had made the promise. And she held on to the promise. Where are you going? Wall as well. Gehazi approaches her and says, is there anything wrong? All is well. Even when Elijah was prompted to say, look, there's something distressing this woman. She never said, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. <laughs> Nothing. She said, listen, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. Don't speak negatively by telling everyone that your promise is dead. So many of us speak or release things from our mouths that make the devil think he's winning. She didn't. She just said it's well. It is well. No negative word came out of her, her mouth. Instead, she lay the problem down in the resting place of the man of God. Well, you can lay your problem down in the resting place of God's infallible word, because that's where his promises are. And then you can go straight to him. The woman grabbed Elijah and then refused to leave him. She grabbed him by the feet. I don't know, maybe some of you need to just put your pride aside and just fall down at God's feet and grab him. And don't let go. If your promises die, grab hold of God's feet and don't let go until you've seen it restored and resurrected. People might try to brush you aside, as Elijah servanted Gehazi. But God looks at your distress and wants to intervene as quickly as possible. So let him do it his way, however strange. He can breathe life into those dead promises. I'm sure if we were present, we would have gone, what is this prophet up to? laying his body on top of the child and putting his eyes on his eyes, his mouth on his eyes. You know, well, this is a strange thing. And then going and doing it again? The boy's dead. Surely he should have just walked in and said, hey, the boy's dead, I'll prophesy another child. No. That was a promise. It was a promise of God. And however strange it may seem... And however God does it for you, your promise is not dead. Your promise is alive. But you can't go around telling everyone, it's not well. My promise is dead. Oh, God's let me down. No, it is well. Because God never, ever, ever 
turns away from his own promise. He watches over every word to ensure that it is performed. Especially his promise. Just as Elijah visited that town, I believe God is ready to visit us. And I'm expecting God to visit in great power. Not just in my own life, but you see, there is this town, you know, my own life that has highways and byways and corridors and, you know, and wherever God goes and every room in my house, he must feel welcome. And I've got to prepare those rooms for him. So God will want, as the prophet did, God will want to come and spend time because he doesn't come and spend time in shabby, you know, Places full of unbelief and doubt and fear. The power of God's not in your life is because he can't be there. He doesn't occupy a space where fear, doubt, and unbelief is present. It's a total contradiction. Where God is, there is love. Love casts out overcomes all fear. Why? Because fear and God's love cannot live in the same place. So there's this town that, that God wants to visit. My life. I've got to make him welcome. I've got to make sure that every room is comfortable for him. That he will want to come back. Amen. Because I've invited him back. And sometimes we might need to persuade him. <laughs> Say, Lord, listen, I know I've blown it in the past. And you confess, and that's persuasion. But Lord, I've put it right. I've cleaned out that room. I've prepared it for you. Come and visit because when God visits, so does his power. I'm expecting God to visit with power. I'm talking about the kind of power Elijah, Peter, Paul, and even Christ himself encountered. I believe that God is ready to pour out that kind of blessing upon this nation. This nation needs it. Never before in all of history has there been so much confusion about every matter. You look at religious institutions, educational institutions, you look at political institutions, financial institutions. The one service we did have, financial services, they're non existent anymore. We've got nothing to offer. Our manufacturing, we've just switched off. It's going to take an act of God. Amen. God wants to visit this nation. Amen. But you know how he visits? The same way he visited that town. He arrives and someone says, God, you're welcome here. This is your house. We've got to welcome him into the church, into our, our, our lives. He's calling us as his church to prepare herself. God is coming to town. Are our hearts ready as this uh, Shunammite woman's house was? Will we be urging him to come and visit or just let him pass us by? Are we willing to be stretched? Pay the price, whatever cost is involved. Are we willing to serve him first and not our own needs? God's power is coming. God's promise is here. Are we prepared to receive it? 
This woman, as I said, is just an awesome example of what God can do through ordinary people. That's why there's no mention of name. It says that she, it, it starts off and says that she was a notable woman. I believe she was notable because she was so generous, so kind. She stood out because of her love of God. For made her notable, but it doesn't say anything else. Say so she was famous because she had a great voice and, you know, she was a top designer or she was a, she was a mother-to-be, a great wife. But that, not even that is mentioned. What's really mentioned is that she had a heart for God. She was constantly looking for God. That's why she spotted this man. She says, ah, that's him. That's the guy. When he's around, God's around. I want him because I want God. Amen. Amen. And then that servant's heart, that gratitude that she expressed all the time. She wasn't just happy with giving him a great meal. And I'll tell you, for him to want to eat there all the time, it must have been good. <laughs> Amen. It wasn't, you know, little dry flakes and a few olives and stuff. I mean, she must have done the whole business. <laughs> Prophet and his and Gehazi must have thought, can't wait to get to that place. But she wasn't just happy with that. She thought, I want him here more permanent. I want to make sure that when he comes, he can stay. So what do I do? Goes up to her husband and says, listen, let's build him a, a really nice room. Put everything in it that he needs so that he can stay. And she, she knew that that room was special because she, it said she stood in the doorway. She would never go in. Wow. And God says, right, I'm going to give you what you've always wanted. See, when we prepare our hearts that way, when we prepare our lives that way, we don't have to ask. He just says, I've got it sorted. You will get it. But then life is life and things come the devil's there to steal, to kill, and destroy. The devil wanted to destroy the promise. So he killed it. Didn't deter her. She said, all is well. It is well. It is well. I want you to say that. No, it is well. No. Wind the devil up. Instead of making him feel like he's, you know, Mr. Macho, he's got it all together, you're giving him all the ideas. He's totally, totally unoriginal. Do you know that? Just look at your life. He'll always try and nail you in the same area until one day he realizes he can't do it anymore. And then he'll try something else. But the, the something else that he tries will be something that you've spoken out. You've made him feel like a winner. When no one has been a loser for longer than the devil. So make him feel the way he is. Amen. She just said, all is well. The devil must have been going ballistic. What do you mean? I've just killed your son. No, all is well. All is well. I'm not letting go of the promise. Because she said to the man of God, don't tease me. Don't lie to me. He said, this time next year you're going to have a son. Your promise is not dead. Start speaking life over those things. It might look like a corpse. She had a corpse in her hand. The promise was a corpse. But she went back laid that corpse in the very bed, the very place where the promise was given. 
And then she made sure that the vessel through whom God spoke came back to that very place. And then she left it up to God. No mention of her knocking on the door. No mention of her wailing outside. No mention. Just, it's up to God and him now. And listen to the end. He called his servant and said, go and get this woman. And so he called her. And when she came in to him, she said, he said to her, pick up your son. And she fell at his feet. So there's no indication that even then, she was 100% sure of the outcome. She was not prepared to let go. That's all. Not like she had some angel appear to her and say, don't worry, you know, Elijah's back, it's all going to be well. No, she watched her mouth, she hung on to the promise, and she didn't care how God did it, whether he did it that night, that day, in that fashion, whether it happened tomorrow or the next year. I tell you what, that woman would have still said the same thing. All is well. It is well. Hallelujah. Anyone got anything from us today? See, I never get tired of the story. Why? Because faith sees. It has eyes. And when you look through the eyes of faith, what do you see? It is well. That's what you see. But you look through the eyes of fear or doubt or unbelief, what do you see? It is dead. The choice is yours. She had a choice. And as I said, no mother could experience anything more traumatic than having her own child die in her arms. So, you know, we're talking about an extreme situation here. And yet she was able to see through the eyes of faith and say, it is well. It is well. It is well. It is well. Hallelujah. I'll keep saying it to you. It is well. It is well. Amen. It's not dead. It's not the end. May look like a corpse, but it's not over with because God gave you the promise. We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Asia, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.